In this video, we're going to answer the question, what are servlets? And even more importantly, what does this have to do with my Spring Boot application? It's coming up. Now, do you like to repeat stuff? Do you like to keep implementing the same pattern over and over and over again? Chances are that you don't. And this is why we use Reach for Toolkits and things to help us out. Why we use things like Spring Boot or maybe Timeleaf Template Engine or some other toolkit that you reach towards to help you code a certain pattern. For example, when it comes to rendering web pages, do you want to sit there and assemble all the bits of HTML, put them all together, do it by hand, or do you rather have a template engine that helps you put the elements together? Something that supports doing layout so you don't have to keep making every page look the same, you have something to help you do that. Well, when it comes to processing web requests, which is what we need for the bulk of e-commerce sites today, we need a toolkit that helps us out when it comes to speaking the language of HTTP. Basically, you need the ability for a website to listen on port 80, do the dance of the protocol of HTTP of reading the path, all the headers, the body if it exists, that kind of stuff, and then handing off all that stuff to our code so we can actually process it for the specifics. Now, you could go write the code yourself. The people that are anti-framework that are like, why should I use a framework? That sounds easy enough. I could just do it myself. Why not go do it yourself and go read HTTP messages? I mean, it's not a complicated spec. If you go read the RFP for HTTP, HTTP it's not difficult, but it's something you're going to have to replicate on every project that you do. Do you have 10, 100, maybe in, by the end of your career, you may have been involved in building thousands of websites. Can you imagine doing that effort over and over again? Something that emerged early in the life cycle of Java, all the way going back to 1996, was the Java servlet specification. The Java servlets are a way to do that, to handle web processing. And the idea is you register some code with the application server. And in, through the specification, what it does is a web request can come in and it will sit there and be able to handle the HTTP protocol. It'll be able to process that stuff. And then there's a handoff point where it actually invokes your custom code. So it's gotten all the information out and then it invokes your code and you have all the information to then do what's unique to your application. Whether you're supposed to render a web page, process JSON data, you know, in fact, when servlet, the servlet spec came out way back then, gosh, what's that, 26 years ago, maybe? When that came out, we didn't have, for example, things like long polling, Comet Protocol. There's other things. We didn't have WebSockets back then. There were things that didn't exist back then. But we wanted the concept of being able to register custom code that gets invoked when hit by a web call. And so this is what the servlet spec gives us. It gives us a contract, a consistent mechanism that we can hang code on that we write today. We can register it today with a servlet container. Now, at the time, you may have had uh, particular app servers at the time that handled servlet requests, but today, you know, we have things that maybe didn't exist back then. Um, something that grew in prominence in the early 2000s was Apache Tomcat, an open source Apache Software Foundation project meant to handle servlet requests. That's all that it does. It does one thing and it does it well. In fact, it's, it's heavily used in the Java community as a servlet container. Doesn't mean you can't have others. There are certainly others. There's the Liberty servlet container, um, Jetty, you know, and there's other ones out there. If you go looking, you can actually find other ones. In fact, you know, if you're, if you're trying to learn how servlets work, you can go tinker with writing your own servlet container. The job of a servlet container is to basically implement that half of the contract. And so when you go write your custom code with your business functionality that serves your customer, you can jump to the business functionality more quickly and get out of this business of doing infrastructure. And that's part of what Spring Boot's message is all about. Stop doing infrastructure. In other words, you don't get paid money for uh, coding servlet specs or implementing that kind of contract. Instead, you get paid when you deliver value to your customer, which means when you're serving up the web pages that they ask you to build, when you're you know, hooking up their shopping cart to the back end system so that they can do business with their own clients. When you get that kind of stuff going and you build the app for your customer, that's where the value is. Just like 
you know, it's a cost and an expense to go stand up a data center, to load up all the servers into a rack, to wire them together. In the same sense, uh, you don't get paid for building the data center. You don't get paid for setting up a servlet container. So when, he, when we're talking with Spring Boot and we're talking about powering web-based e-commerce applications, what we want to use is a very widely accepted standard that's very good at what it's doing, and that is the servlet spec. Now, it behooves us to dig in a little bit and see what, what does servlet mean? What is that word? Uh, well, in, in English, it's a, it's a diminutive of server. So you have a server that's sitting there receiving requests. It's, it's sort of an extension of the servler. Server. <laughs> servler. It's an extension of the server meant to receive those web requests. So it's a, it's a com small piece that you add to the server, a servlet, that gives you the hook to do your custom code. Now, I'm, I, I kind of threw a bunch of stuff out there. I talked about Spring Boot and the value stuff, and I talked about servlets, and you may be boggled because perhaps you've already been building some Spring Boot applications already. You've built some web pages, am I right? You know, by the way, smash the like button if you've already started building your first Spring Boot application or more. Now, Spring Boot applications, especially if we're gonna use Spring MVC, that's Spring Boot's servlet-based solution, uses servlets. Spring Boot's Spring MVC solution is based on the servlet spec. Did you know this? Maybe you weren't aware of that, but under the hood, it uses servlets. Now, how can this be? In Spring Framework, there's an implementation of the custom of our side of the spec called the dispatcher servlet. The dispatcher servlet is something you used to have to register it by hand. It took special steps to configure it. But with Spring Boot, you don't even have to think about it. It's auto configured for you. What the dispatcher servlet does for you is it hooks into the servlet container and it provides a point where this where Apache Tomcat or whomever can invoke the code and then Spring takes it from there. For several years, Spring MVC has had support for an annotation-based call method where you can go annotate controller methods with at get mapping, at post mapping, at delete mapping, and so forth for all the various HTTP verbs. And what it does is the dispatcher servlet is the glue from that servlet container that gets hit by the web request coming through and finding your annotated web methods. The dispatcher servlet is the first point where you enter Springland and its job is to go find whichever method is relevant. So it does a lookup process. It used to be, you know, to build a servlet based application, you wrote the code that got invoked directly and you registered it, but it tended to have a lack of flexibility or it, it required you to hook in a lot to it. And this is where people started building frameworks. People wanted utilities to simplify the process. And then further on down the road, there was actually an introduction of an annotation-based lookup model, but not for servlets. Instead, it first came to Spring's web service module, the toolkit that handles SOAP requests. The project lead for it at the time, Aryan Putsma, implemented an annotation-based thing shortly after Java 5 came out. And it would sit there and go figure out which SOAP-based method in your code it needed to call, and it invoked it. And after that was rolled out there back when SOAP was a lot, a lot more popular, um, people really loved it. So Aryan actually invested a lot of effort to go add that to Spring MVC and Spring Framework. It used to be to write a custom controller, you extended part of Spring Framework. You did class extension. This is kind of the way we used to do things back before Java 5. But with the incredible popularity of annotations and your ability to get away from extending framework classes, you can instead just annotate your class at controller and then annotate your method at get mapping and you'd put the details in there. Now, if you don't put anything, it's just going to map everything that comes to that slash path onto that method. But you have opportunities. You can alter the path that it's going to respond to. You can change, you can make it specific to particular headers or this method only responds to these particular media types. You could have uh, several methods where one of them is based on, if you're looking for text or HTML, use this one. But if you're looking for a PDF file, that method will actually serve up the PDF file. So you can have discriminators like that added to your stuff. And all of this stuff is not part of the servlet spec. All that the servlet spec does is it gives you a path to go from you know incoming web 
incoming web request gets into the servlet container, all the HTTP-based information, the headers, the data, the path, all that's pulled out through the, through the servlet spec, and it invokes this little custom piece of code called the dispatcher servlet. The dispatcher servlet then goes on and invokes whatever is the proper method for that. And from that, we've been able to build things like uh, HTML template engines. We've had pure JSON-based APIs. In the past, we used to serve up XML API, XML data before JSON became uh, the popular thing that it is today. And you know, we even have other things like we now can support WebSockets, for example. Now, WebSockets are a whole other beast, so I'm not going to go into that. But the importance is that by having a common contract underpinning all of our web applications, it's possible to go take a Spring application and go run it on any compliant serverless container, whether that's Apache Tomcat or Jetty or Liberty or whoever releases a new serverless container next week. Whatever that is, servlets have become a very popular standard to base web applications are on. And some of this leads to the fact that you can actually go in and customize how servlets are handled. You can actually dig in to Spring Boot and look up more details about servlets and do some of your own customizations if you're interested in that. In your Spring MVC method with that get mapping, not only can you have incoming data provided as an argument, but you can also, get this, you can also ask for the servlet context. This is part of the servlet spec, and typically you don't have to dig into this stuff, but you can actually say, give me a copy of the servlet context. Give me a copy of, of the handle on this standard object that has various bits of information embedded in it about the servlet request. So you can ask for that and get handed that and interact with it. So the next time you're working on a Spring MVC app, go check that out. Now, if you're trying to get off the ground with building a Spring Boot application, why don't you check this out? This video is sponsored by Learning Spring Boot 3.0 Third Edition. Do you want to build a Java app without wasting time? Do you need to create a web layer backed by a powerful yet intuitive data layer? And do you want to protect your users with the most up-to-date and widely used security tools? Learning Spring Boot 3.0 Third Edition will show you the way. And to top things off, it even includes how to deploy and maintain your application in production. Check it out at springbootlearning.com slash book and pre-order your copy today. Now, assuming that you've gone and, and uh, pre-ordered your copy, let's get back to it. Servlets are very successful because it's a well-defined contract. It's also successful because it's a contract that hasn't changed heavily over time. It's had small adjustments. It's had small updates. For example, when it first came out, it was all... It was all blocking, there was no sense of asynchronous support, but that got added on in later revisions. So now what we call what was called back then Java servlets is today known as Jakarta servlets, since the Jakarta Java movement has now taken over all of the Java EE stuff and their standards. And so throughout time we've had additions. We have support for like async operations. So you you can also get deferred results. Okay. So you can say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna process this, but the answer may not come immediately. I'm going to give it back in a form of a, of a future or something like that. However, there are certain limitations in there. For example, the whole contract presumes a sort of blocking-based API. And if you're confused about what that is, then you can go check out some of the uh, other content on this channel. I've also talked about things like Project Reactor, which is a non-blocking back pressure-based system. So Netty is a fully asynchronous top to bottom web container. It's not based on Java servlet stuff, okay? It's not confined to that. So we have Reactor Netty, a project that wraps Netty with the stuff to give it the reactor flows of monos and fluxes. And if you don't have any clue what I'm talking about, then stay tuned because I am coming out with a new video to talk about what are reactive streams. But for today, just know that uh, something like Reactor Netty opens doors to other ways of doing stuff beyond the servlet spec. But servlet specs themselves, even though it contains some support for asynchronous behavior, is not a guaranteed way to implement 100% asynchronous operations. The servlet spec has served us well, and in truth, probably, it's just a rough number, but probably 80% of all websites out there work just fine with a blocking servlet container. So it's all to say, we're gonna have servlets for a lot longer. There will probably be enhancements, improvements, tweaks and adjustments, but the servlet spec on a whole isn't making huge changes. It's not a lot of, of migration and innovation that's coming. 
It's a good thing to have solid, well-established specs that all the components, all the tool kits can all agree upon. And that's what leads to a solid ending. If you're gonna build a Spring MVC app with serving up templates and handling JSON operations, then you need to go check out this video where I found the most valuable programmer in the gaming universe.